In order to use the backward Euler method to come up with an expression for w at the n plus 1 step, we know that we're going to need an expression for w dot. So that's the first thing we deal with, beginning with our equation for the force of friction. We know that the acceleration of the wheel depends on the force of friction divided by the mass of the wheel. So we plug in this expanded version of the equation for the force of friction into the equation for w dot, and of course subtract b. And the backward Euler method says that w at the nth plus 1 step is equal to w at the nth step plus the step size times the change in w at the nth plus 1 step. So now that we have our expression for w dot, we can plug it into the proper location in the equation below. We've rewritten s, the wheel slip, which you see here and here, as 1 minus w at the nth plus 1 step over v, which of course is just an equivalent expression. This gets rid of any explicit dependence on s. You'll remember from what I said earlier that v here changes much more slowly than w does, so we didn't specify which v we're referring to right here, but if we were to be more clear, this is v sub n plus 1. Now with a little bit of rearranging, we can rewrite this equation for w at n plus 1 as this equation right here. Now it may seem slightly counterintuitive to rearrange things like this, since this expression looks maybe longer and more awkward than this one does. Remember, however, that our initial request for w was that it obey an equation of the form that I wrote up here. We have a term with w sub n plus 1 and a term with e to that value, and also a constant, all of this added together equaling 0. That is exactly what we have down here now. This makes our job very simple. Remember, we wanted to identify what c, d, f, and k are, and now we can just read them directly off of this equation. In order to implement the backward Euler method in the code now, all we have to do is translate the variables c, d, f, and k into code, just like I've done right here. Now the expression for w that the solver is going to output is equivalent to the one that we just found using the backward Euler method. So it's very simple. Since the solver was already established for us, all we had to do is fill in the proper values for these variables. Now in the introduction video, I didn't talk much about what this solver is actually doing. So now I'll just take a second to explain that. It's implementing something called the newton raphson method. And this is a method used for solving implicit equations that are not linear. So it's a perfect fit for the situation that we're faced with right now. Now let's say I have a function, like this green curve right here, for which I want to find the x value of a certain point. Maybe, for example, I'd like to find the x value of this x-intercept right here. So the thing that we actually know about this point then is the y value, which is 0. To use the newton raphson method, I start by making a guess at what the x value that pairs with that y value is. So maybe I guess the x-coordinate that corresponds to this blue line right here. What the newton raphson method does is it takes the slope of the line tangent to the green curve at this point, so maybe that tangent line looks a little something like this, and extends that line down to the y value that we're interested in. Now the next x value that I'll guess is going to be the point where that tangent line intersects the x-axis in this case. Then I'll do the same thing for this point, and so on and so forth, and eventually my results will converge to the actual point that I'm looking for. This is a very effective method for solving implicit equations. The general equation showing the movement from one guess to the next guess is shown right here. So we can specify this to deal with the situation we're looking at by using this equation right here. And in fact, that is exactly what's written in the code in this expression for w underscore nu. Now that we understand how our solver is working, let's look at the plot we get. What we have here is a series of plots that all depend on time. First we have position, then car velocity, then wheel velocity, and then wheel slip. The different series, shown by the different colors in each plot, represent different values for the magnitude of the braking acceleration. If you zoomed in really close on the different parts of the top graph, you'll be able to tell that 70 meters per second squared is the blue line, 100 meters per second squared is the green line, 130 the red line, 160 the cyan line, and 190 the magenta line. So we can see then how different braking accelerations affect these four different quantities. Interestingly enough, it's the 130 meters per second braking, which is one of the middle values, that makes the car stop first. When we slam on the brakes really hard, which is shown up with the magenta and cyan lines, the wheels stop rotating very quickly. You can see the wheel velocity goes to zero right away. However, in tandem with that, the wheel slip increases dramatically, and the wheels are locked very early on. As a result, the car velocity doesn't actually slow down much. Of course, as we would expect, if we just don't put the brakes on very hard, like with the blue line, then the car does go a pretty far distance, and it actually doesn't come to a stop at all in the time that we've allowed. However, this is a great example of how slamming on your brakes is not the most effective braking method. Great job on this problem.